L. L, you need to contact me, okay? <laughs> I'm not reporting you, which I get into big trouble for that. Um, but I'm, I'm gonna be in big trouble with the Dean because I'm not reporting you. Um, I keep talking to you, but I'm supposed to report you. <laughs> so please, um, uh, no, I'm not getting emails from you, Al. Oh, okay, well then that explains some of it because I'm not. Um, why don't I give you my phone number and uh, you absolutely have to call me, okay? Because um, there's lots of possible hours that you could call me, so. Um, okay. All right, so here is for the recording for people who didn't make it. There's just clarification on the requirements. You, I would like your research papers to be in in five days. I have so far met with one person about her research paper. So it's not looking good unless all of you have set aside this huge chunk of time to do the paper right at the last minute. Um, I'm pretty kind of worried about this. Um, okay, so sometimes I forget to open up the Zoom. Please email me via my Lion uh, account. I will try in the next week to be super conscientious about it. You know, I'll just poke myself and I'll write a big office hours, you know, with a circle around it. And I'll try to keep, you know, keep on task. But really, truly, I think you could get a hold of me. I will also um, have office hours at the opposite time, right? 8 or 9 a.m. instead of 8 or 9 p.m. If that's helpful to some of you. Um, I know some of you have all sorts of internet issues. So again, I haven't been nagging, but <laughs> the 29th is the absolute deadline for everything. And I just worry about you. That's the main thing. I'm just worried about some of you. I don't want you to crash and burn at the end. Um, you do have another final paper due and I will hold off on when that's due because it's a final. So I'll, you know, I'll, um, okay, the grades are due. So the final paper, which is just your own assimilation of the material, and half of it has to include something from, Agam from Hecuba on, that won't be due until the 6th of May. So I'm giving you, I'm cutting you a whole lot of slack. Um, going, I don't know if I'm going against the rules. So, you know, <laughs> it's just that there are few enough of you and I'm only teaching at one class, so I could get them read in that few days. So that's okay. Um, just please don't crash and burn, please. <laughs> you know, do your work. Uh, find some time somewhere in there to do the work for this class. Um, all right, then, uh, all right. so that's what we have. We have a few more weeks of class. We have the research paper. We have the final paper. Um, I will have lots of office hours if you want. Just contact me. Um, Rossi is, toward the end of the class, Rossi is gonna explain how she does research. I don't know how many of you um, know how to get access to JSTOR. If you do, if you are getting access to JSTOR, why don't you contact, get on a discussion group with the other members of the class because some of the other ones are having trouble. Um, I don't wanna go into that right now because I do wanna do the lecture. I did 
demand of you. I said it's required that you say something about the play today because, you know, I have cut you a lot of slack. I thought you would, you know, again, be much further on your research because you didn't have to post for last week, but um, all right. <laughs> I Again, I know you have other things to do. It's just not looking good from my point of view. Um, I don't know if you like my class or not, and I'll find out on the evaluation. Um, but I am teaching two classes this summer. One is philosophical psychology. That's on Monday morning and Wednesday morning, the same as this same time slot. And then I'm teaching environmental ethics on Tuesday and Thursday at the same time slot. Um, and environmental ethics, I am going to use some of Aristotle's virtues, but I also just read, and I'm really excited about this, that the UNESCO has a whole educational system for educating people uh, for the virtues, and there are scholarly articles out. I just found this book um, published by Oxford. And it talks about linking the UNESCO virtues with Aristotle's virtues, which is really exciting because I have published a lot <laughs> about how you can take Aristotle's virtues and use it uh, specifically with the UN. I've done it with um, Indonesia's Panchasila. I've done it with a lot of things. It's something I've just been doing. So that's really exciting. If you want to take environmental ethics, you'll be kind of familiar with kind of the basic structure of it. And you know how it's relevant because you were talking about sustainability early, early on when we talked about Crete. Um, the philosophical psychology class, it's going to go through the Western um, enlightenment and it's going to have a number of psychology views of psychology that all these mood altering drugs, you know, the whole Western psychology thing is about, and it's very much imposed on developing countries. It's not the way they think of the human psyche. Um, but we will have um, one view of ancient philosophy, the Romans, but then we'll go into uh, a little bit of Catholic, but then it's going to be the blank slate and it's going to be um, behavior modification, the whole view that you can mold people to be good. That was big in the Enlightenment. Um, and the other thing is Kant giving yourself absolute principles. Uh, again, that's very influential. And then we have a neuro, a neuroscientist who was a major player in creating opioids, but neuroscience has shown that the enlightenment was wrong about psychology. And then he's explaining, he likes Spinoza uh, because he thinks neuroscience fits with Spinoza. Well, I studied Spinoza in my uh, graduate schools, one of my exams, and I decided the Greeks were better at programming the psyche for wisdom than Spinoza was. So I actually wrote a book uh, responding to him. And so that class will have a number of chapters from that book, but it will have some other stuff like um, a psychology written by a guy in um, artificial intelligence and stuff like that. So it starts with the old stuff and then it comes into some new stuff. Um, and the environmental ethics also starts with the old stuff that explains why the United States is destroying the earth and it has the most science. It's because of its culture and its values. And again, that gets exported to developing countries and people in developing countries, I think need to know some of that history because it still applies. And so the first month or so will be this historical context. 
And all of a sudden, the students last year, they thought the first three weeks is just like, ah, I hate this class. And then all of a sudden, whammo, <laughs> they understood the connection between that and absolutely everything um, that they're interested in and capitalism and how it exploits their desires and all this stuff. So it, it did catch on. And then we can start talking about the UN. We can start talking about Actually, you do a research paper on some environmental issue in each of your countries. So then you get to explore further whatever um, you know environmental issue is of particular importance to you. Uh, and then we do have that general final paper, which is what what's my takeaway from this, right? What do I think a healthy psyche is, or what do I think environmental consciousness should be like? So. So my courses all, you know, are sort of the structure is the same, the content is different. So, you know, it's up to you what you like to do. Um, all right. So let's just start. I'm going to start with uh, just calling on you all. And I said, you have to make a comment either before the lecture or after the lecture or both. But I'm going to start with you know, before, if any of you pre have prepared something. Um, so I'm just going to call on each of you, but I really, really want everyone to talk at some point because we have really lost a lot of people along the way recently. Um, okay, Rossi, what you got? Um, for me, I really find the part where Agamemnon and Hecuba was having a conversation fascinating relating to when he, oh, when um, Agamemnon is curious whether, like, how can women defeat them? I find that fascinating because even back in the days, like during the Greeks time, like, they still doubt women and our ability, like, I know getting revenge is bad, but, um, doubting someone because of their gender is still a thing back then and it is still happening now and i feel like regardless of how progressive the world is that mentality still doesn't change and it's harmful because they should look past our gender when we are trying to do something and i feel like we are more capable of doing so many things when we believe in one another and not just like look at our gender and then like determine like what we can and cannot accomplish. Yeah, you know what? You know what the irony of that is? Everything is super ironic, right? So he's saying, how could Paul, yeah, he's saying, how can your women uh, servants be able to overpower a man, right? They don't think, you know, he doesn't think that they could actually take take revenge on him. Is that right, yes. Rossi? I mean, the irony is, the irony is Hecuba did overpower Agamemnon through her rhetoric. She manipulated him into making this horrible decision, which the Thebans, if the winds hadn't picked up right then, they would have completely massacred his people. Does that make sense, Rossi? Yes, Professor. I mean, that's the real way women get back at men is passive aggressive or um, manipulation, right? Rhetoric. Uh, it's so ironic. So I do want you to get this sense that everything is said, just turn it right upside down. And that happens in life a lot. I hope you notice that. <laughs> People are ignorant and they project the very thing that they do, right? They blame others for the very thing they do, or they're really deluded. And I mean, it's just amazing how blind and ignorant they are. But even then, like the characters don't necessarily ever learn anything, but that's where the audience is supposed to learn. And they're supposed to go down to the taverna and talk about it and you can find out what people learned. And it tells you something about their character, just like Delphi, remember? They give you a riddle. So like the tragedy is a riddle and everybody solves it, it reveals their character in the way 
that they solve the riddle or interpret the play. So, sorry, I'm going to talk too much. <laughs> okay, Poppy, did you get something? Poppy? Okay. Nahida? Okay, she didn't get anything. Okay. Do type in something so we can just keep moving. Nahida, did you get something? Okay, I don't think you put something on the chat. Abondono. Okay. Okay, so Bondona can't do it. Um, let's see. Uh, what about Nahida? Are you there or did I did I lose you? All right. Uh, Fahima. Okay. Rupia. Okay, so please put something in the chat. If, if there's nothing in the chat, it means either you've lost the connection or I don't know. <laughs> I'll just assume that that's the problem that it seems like if you lose the connection, I wouldn't see your, your picture. Okay, so Madeline's having computer issues too. Okay, she'll type her response when it gets to be her turn. Okay, that works. Um, where are we? Um, I'll keep looking at the chat though now, right? I'm sort of adjusting. But Louis, do you have something? Um, yes, I have one thing. Like when I read the, the story of Hecuba and look at the outline, they depart like reversal, happiness to misery, and misery to happiness. Uh, when I read the part, I just rely a surprising fact. Like, I always want to escape foreign problems, like run away from suffering. But when I look back at my life, these things actually push me to become like a better and more responsible people. Um, when I look back, actually, my most radical change in thinking uh, often like happen at the end of the worst moment. It's only when I am in like misery, I'm willing to look at my situation, like my belief and question, like whether it is fit with my value and mission or not. Like for example, I felt myself suffering in the meaningless life as high school, like spending more of the time politely chasing ranking, like competing with friends. Then I stopped for a while, questioning whether it's what I want in life. And I dared to quit and I find a more suitable environment for myself, like I found a UW. And I just realized that <laughs> misery is not only something terrible and negative. It's um, on the other side, like it's also make us stronger and more resilient. Like these work moment generate, like I think the motivation and aspiration to actually change. When I read this part and I thinking, I just, ah, oh, this is how it's work. <laughs> like maybe it's surprising for me because I don't know about it. I just realized yesterday, but I think it's how it's work. Okay, yeah. good. Um, yeah, so uh, I, when you get back to AUW, whenever that is, um, it's not like it's going to be utopia, but whenever uh, a student does criticize another student, which I guess the students told me that that happens, I, I want you to go find someone else in this class, right? <laughs> and, and commiserate, you know, at least you know someone else in the class who decided as soon as I get to campus, I'm not going to be critical of other women, right? I'm going to support them. And you can try to convince, you know, somebody who is doing that. But if you can't convince them, you do need to find solidarity with other friends, right? You probably have some friends, but make sure you don't get isolated. 
um, when you see that happen because it's so important for you to hang together. That's really important. Um, I guess I say that because I got isolated myself and that was just really not good. <laughs> you just keep beating up on yourself. It's not that, not good. Okay, Margia, have you got something? Let's see, did you type in something? Nope. Do you have something, Margia? Okay. Um, Madeline said she's going to have to type in. So here she comes. Oh, so Margia doesn't have anything. Okay. Madeline is going to type her answer, she says. So um, go ahead, Madeline. I'll just read it. Okay. She says, quote, oh, this is DT. All right. Okay. I'm just going to read DTs right now. Um, I also think women are more capable of doing office work because they're already trained by their housework. I believe if women can lead their families, they can also contribute to outside work. And that's what makes them more experienced than men. Um, yeah, I think that there's lots of reasons why the characteristics of women tend to be better in the workplace. I think I told you that this research was done where people said, what qualities of character do you look for in a boss, right? And then they list them all. And then uh, what qualities of character do you associate with men bosses or women bosses? I don't think they ask them right side to side or they'll catch on. But, you know, lo and behold, it was women, the characteristics they related to women that were always the ones they look for in a boss. And then they asked, uh, do you th which kind, what kind of a boss would you prefer, a man or a woman? And they say, a man. <laughs> but I think sooner or later, that's not going to be it. Um, but that I don't know what that has to do with um, the play, right? The Hecuba play. So DT, I don't know. Um, what that has to do, the main thing in um, the Hecuba play is that women are just as smart as men and you shouldn't, you shouldn't think that they're going to go along with stuff. Women are capable of just as high a level of excellence as men because Polyxena is clearly way better than any other man. Um, and women are just as capable of uh, blinding Polymester and killing his sons, right? <laughs> because they can do it in ways that recognize their, they aren't physically, right? They didn't physically beat up on Polymester. They surrounded him and then just held him down, right? So like eight of them are holding him down and they blinded him before they killed the kids so that, right, he wouldn't fight back. I mean, it, when you're the weaker one, you can figure this stuff out. <laughs> it's not just a matter of beating your chest, you know, and I have better uh, upper body strength than you. So um, so that those are messages, but I don't know how they're related to women can do office work better. So DT, you can um, elaborate on that now or later when I call on you later. Um, all right, so where are we now? Madeline's going to be later. Rook nine, do you have something? All right, so again, just type in, you know, even just type in, no, I don't have anything. Um, it does worry me a little because I asked Dr. Cohn, you know, I said I have some students that are falling behind and she said, well, yeah, I have about two. And I was like, I have 12, you know, I have 12 students out of, 
you know, 17 or whatever that are falling behind. But I didn't want to tell her that. I just am not sure why. And um, I just don't want to cause you grief. And I can't figure out what to do about that. Um, so like Rook 9, I don't have any idea, right? If you're there, if I can't, right? I, just, I don't know. Um, and I, it doesn't seem to me that other professors have this much trouble. Um, but I'll just put it on the YouTube and we'll just keep going. Um, just tell me, let me know via email exactly what else I could do to help you, okay? If there is something else I can do. Um, Jareen, do you have something? Okay, nope. Um, has Bina? Do you have something? Later, okay. Um, Claire? Do you have something, Claire? Um, well, maybe it is raining here, so I don't know uh, after. Okay. Let's see. DT. Oh, we've already done DT. Okay. May, do you have something? Um, for me, like, I want to give a comment on, like, Hikuba. I think she is the uh, example of a ruler who likes the empathy and also the long-term vision and I think it is extremely dangerous for a leader and a ruler um, because like he she has always like taken the pleasure from taking revenge and he she's always like um I don't know like obsessed by the idea of getting revenge so that's why he she like totally lacks the empathy and even the long-term vision for like what the consequences might be after those actions because like after killing polymeter's son the, the thing is many women are becoming like homeless and helpless and um there there are even more like destruction in the cities that couldn't be like um rebuilt in the short term in the short time i mean so I think that even in today's context, if the ruler lacks empathy and only care about like individual interests or the interests of this uh, small group of people, it would be like a very dangerous thing because like more innocent people will suffer even when they do nothing wrong. So it's just like my comment. <laughs> yeah, okay, so very good. That was one of the main things I pointed out that each of those leaders has now given their city a horrible reputation for 30 years, right? Um, and they had a chance to give their city a really good reputation. I mean, that's, that's the thing. So if Hecuba had accepted freedom, you know, gotten to Argos, Agamemnon let her go. He said he would. Everybody would look at her and say, well, Troy wasn't that bad, you know? Like, you know, and they'd think twice. And they would let Troy rebuild. But because she did what she did, they're never going to let them rebuild, right? They, she set them back decades, probably. Then Agamemnon, you know, he was the most powerful guy. He could have, you know, created a whole world of city-states that get along with each other. But he allowed Hecuba to have a private meeting with the guy who gave his people hospitality. He put all his people in extreme danger. He acted like he could do whatever he wanted. So nobody's going to trust them, right? Everybody's going to gear up against Argos and Agamemnon's city-state. And then, of course, Polymester. 
he could have had a fantastic reputation. And Hecuba told him that, you know, if you'd kept him safe, everybody would say, oh, Thebes is such a wonderful city state. And they have such a wonderful leader and he has two sons and they're going to have this great future and he just ruins everything. So the idea there is that everything you do has political consequences. Now, this is where, again, if you live in Afghanistan or something, it, this might not be true, certainly not at the national level, but I guess you'd have to just at the local village level. I mean, there's some level there where the, what's personal is also political in some, it, to some reach, right? Some extent, I'm not quite sure, um, but I'm sure that you can apply it that way in a, in a smaller scale. Um, this material was written for the Athenians who were taking, you know, they had a big place, they were engaged and they were the ones that voted for public policy. Um, anybody who wanted to go to war wanted a lot of stuff. They had to go in front of the assembly and it was just an assembly of the citizens and they voted. So these plays were written to educate the public because the public really was gonna make the decisions. Um, so, but I still think there's plenty to learn, even when you're in a situation like Afghanistan, which is, you know, getting worse or time will tell, but um, I'm sure, I'm sure that's true in your village or maybe your region or something like that. So, um, let's see, who's next? News Rod, do you have something? Okay. Um, Al, do you have something? I think the uh, the emphasis on hospitality throughout the whole story is very important, and how important it is not to break hospitality because first you have, and his name escapes me, but the the king of the thieves that he he Polynester. kills. Polynester kills the son of Hecuba violating hospitality, which is a huge no-no. And it kind of poses this question that, well, yeah, his hospitality is getting violated by Agamemnon, by uh, him assisting Hecuba in this. And is it okay to do that just because he violated hospitality to violate his hospitality? Is that okay? And I think that's like an underlying question present in the story that you're really supposed to think about, especially with um, uh, there's there's a theme of an eye for an eye throughout Hecuba, where Hecuba wants the revenge in killing the sons of uh, Polynester, you know, and it's is that right? No, it's not right, and it just kind of um, uh, I think it's like a big picture kind of commentary on it. It's not only that, it's not just a matter of principle, like you put your whole city in danger now, right? Does that make sense, Elle? Yes, yes. People are going to invade Thebes, right? Or at least ignore it, not trade with it, you know? Huge harm done to your city when you do that. Um, I think analogously today, that was, member Delphi was international law, natural justice, right? So there is this standard of natural justice over and above what people can control, over and above even the gods, and it keeps bubbling up. It'll come back to you. <laughs> um, yeah, so so that's that's good. It's a combination of treat others the way you want to be treated, the golden rule. Um, don't, you know, don't fight back, don't take revenge. And then also, it's not just a moral principle, it's not just personal. It has huge ramifications because you leave behind a legacy, a story about your city. 
Um, okay, Lakin, do you have something? Oh, okay. Let's see, Rupia, you're back again. Do you have something? I think you get disconnected. I think some people are getting disconnected and reconnecting. Um, okay, Nahida, do you have something? The prof. Sir. Uh, okay, so a lot of students type up in their posts really interesting things. They just can't, you know, they have internet issues. Is there something you want to type in, Nahida? Here it comes. Okay. All right. Um, Untari, do you have something? Um, yeah, Professor. Um, uh, from what you say and what I got is like Hecuba go this far because as we know, like women mostly in more into emotion rather than uh, logic, right? And that's what society think. And by illustrated like this, it's like uh, people try to illustrate how social, uh, how society pictures how if woman who is more into emotion rather than rational, and they are try to get in a political field, and because women more into emotion rather than a logic, they mostly are likely going to be Hecuba. And if we let women into politics, it will just go like a disaster or they will try to make a decision based on their emotion rather than logic or something like that. That's what I get, Professor. Well, the, what's interesting about that is that that would be, you know, when the audience members go down to the taverna and they decide what they learned, right? Somebody would definitely say that. The thing is, a counter argument to that is that when she's arguing against Odysseus, she understands leadership and she's more insightful than him. But the key there, the thing that drove her nuts was killing her kids. And, and, and also Agamemnon sleeping with Cassandra was distorting his judgment. And so I think it's also saying, don't kill kids, you know, because <laughs> you're going to get yeah. a reaction from women that is actually a healthy emotional reaction. Does that make sense, Untari? Yeah, yeah. yeah I also think that uh, even though if it's not Hecuba or it's anyone, if it's not woman or it's it girl, the response will be the same. They will be angry, of course, because if uh, he, their son or their doctor was killed by people and then they meet the killer, of course, they will get angry. Right, I mean, you want, okay, if you want women to play the role of wife, and mother, right? We want you to care about nothing else than that. Oh, but we'll kill your kids whenever we feel like it, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, you know what? They're going to react. So I think, does yeah. that make sense? Sorry. Yeah, yeah Professor. <laughs> you're, you're really putting them in a horrible spot. Um, so I do think that you do want to re-examine what the heck are you doing with women and how is that poisoning political association and it's not necessarily their fault on the other hand it's titled Hecuba like it's saying Hecuba you did have a choice yes those men were really nasty they were horrible yes yes but still what you did you could have held off. 
Um, but anyway, it's a lot of lessons to men too. Just don't treat women in these horrible ways. Okay, so Nahida said, so what I've understood is as a human, we have our own choices, we have power, we have grief. We can be honest from our own position. It will help us to flourish in our life. And at the end of the day, we can create a better society and culture. Um, I think that's especially true for the women at AUW, right? So you, you've got, you have enough, like you have enough natural ability, enough motivation, enough opportunity, so that I hope you can avoid right, burning bridges or overreacting because of how much you have so far, right? Um, I don't wanna speak for somebody who really, you know, wasn't given natural ability. Maybe they weren't motivated because their parents told them they shouldn't want anything else. Maybe they were, um, they had no opportunity. I mean, it's hard to judge a person like that, but for yourself, yeah. You know, I do think for you to realize every day that you do have the power of choice. And if you can, no matter how many obstacles there are, I think you can pull yourself up and I will definitely try to help you. I'm not, you know, all the teachers are on your side. Whenever we meet, we meet once a month. And I'm telling you, they're all, they're all behind you. However, they, I don't know how they act as professors, what they communicate to you, whatever they do communicate is what they think is appropriate, but they definitely all want you to do well. Um, Okay, so I, uh, uh, let's see, Kajia, do you have something? Let's see. Are you there? No, Professor, I got disconnected. I just joined several times and got disconnected again and again. Do you have anything you want to say right now? No, no. Okay, so. Okay, so I'll give the lecture and then I really would like to call on people again, because all you have to do is react to something that I said. Um, okay, so here is the um, All right. Here's, there is a long, long outline and I hope that you went through it. And uh, it's 32 pages right it's really long. It's just all the different perspectives that you can take on, on the dialogue. I'm going to start um, on page 25 because we'll never get through it all. But hopefully you could just eyeball it and just think about, yeah, all of Aristotle's virtues in relationship to each of those characters. Um, because, because it's not just because this is an intellectual exercise. It's like life, right? <laughs> all these virtues are a part of all of our lives. And so if we can use a play to remind us, you know, oh yeah, this is part of life. This is part of life. And here's a type of person in a type of situation making a type of decision. So you were already doing that with the gods, right? That's why I'm starting out with the gods here, that the people who've been trained in the Olympian uh, pantheon, the 12 gods, are going to recognize which, which character is possessed by which god, even though Euripides doesn't bring in the gods because he's, he wrote at a time when the Athenians gave up on, you know, they don't believe in the gods, right? That's stupid. But what Euripides is trying to say is, you know what, all the lessons are there and you're not learning the lessons of those myths, right? So you're really not so superior because you gave up on religion uh, because you're still doing all the stuff that all those stories was trying to tell you not to do. So I'm trying to tell you not to do it based on principles 
of justice, right? Okay, forget the gods. Let's talk about justice. And uh, don't do this. <laughs> okay, so let's go back to the gods. Um, you know that in general, it means spiritual humanism, uh, the quest for moral order. Um, we have ideas of justice and just and good and evil, but we have to constantly be thinking about them, right? You have to live an examined life. There's no noble savage. It's not like there was some, like by nature, we love virtue and culture corrupts us. No, you know, Odysseus claims to believe that, but he doesn't believe it. And um, on the other hand, so it's not true that we are good by nature and culture corrupts us. It's also not true that we're corrupt by nature and culture what brings us in line, you know, civilizes us. It's this very dynamic relationship. But underneath all the culture and how it affects individuals, there still is this basic human condition that keeps bubbling up under the surface. Um, all right, so people are driven by um, all these passions, right, for something greater than yourself. Um, they want to create communities. So, you know, all 12 of those deities are lots of different ideas of the good and lots of different legitimate things people do. Okay, so we have, and then I, I mentioned, I listed all of those. They make mistakes. They represent people getting caught between conflicting demands and, um, all right, so remember Aphrodite, she's supposed to be the vision carrier, but in a patriarchy, she triggers a sex drive and men, mostly men, not always, um, undermines marriage, social order and goodwill. Okay, so um, Zeus, you remember Zeus, um, he has a lot of affairs, he forgets his responsibilities as a leader. It creates a whole lot of problems. It, the, the goddesses are wounded. Their children are wounded. Uh, it's all sort of dysfunction. Now, let's look at Agamemnon, right? They would recognize that he's the Zeus character because he is the winner, right? He's the guy on top. His side won in the war, so he has all this power or he thinks he does. Um, now he's got Cassandra, he's got a problem with Aphrodite as you know, shot her arrow and he's sleeping with Cassandra and he actually likes her. <laughs> it's not just a power thing, he likes her. Um, and this always corrupts his judgment, okay? Now, when they were in the debate, uh, when he and Odysseus were debating with the soldiers about whether or not to kill Polyxena, the story was that he spoke in favor of not killing her, but the soldiers thought, well, his judgment is corrupted because he's sleeping with Cassandra. So his judgment wasn't respected, even though he had the right opinion, but the wrong reason, right? I hope you understand that. He had the right opinion, don't kill her. But the reason was, well, it's Cassandra's sister. It's like, no, that's not a good reason. Um, okay. Then the reason why it's important is because later on, when Hecuba wants to take revenge, she appeals again to Cassandra, right? And she says, well, you know, I gave you all these pleasures. You remember my daughter, uh, we're doing you a favor so you can maybe do me a favor, right? So it's the same reason. Um, and he, so in that case, he makes the wrong decision for the same reason. And that's why it's always the wrong reason. Um, Okay, all right. 
he doesn't occur to him to say, okay, Hecuba, because Polyzena was killed, I'll let you uh, um, be free with Cassandra, right? Maybe she would have taken revenge as much, but it doesn't even cross his mind because Cassandra is his property. <laughs> okay, so he, he's always blind, right? But Agamemnon, he can't blame Aphrodite. It's his own sex drive and it's his own judgment. So that's where in the past, the characters would blame Aphrodite right, when they talked about the gods. And of course, the, the messages of the play was, no, buddy, it's you. And so by the time you get to um, uh, Euripides, they don't bother with the gods, but you still have the responsibility, right? It's even more blatant that it's your fault because it's not some goddess intervening. All right, then you have Apollo. So, Remember, you remember Apollo because you all came up with good examples, or most of you, some of you couldn't think of any, which I thought was pretty amazing because they're so much in the public eye, these Apollonian types. Uh, they are the CEOs of companies and they run efficient companies and they're very ordered and they're very rational in the sense of 10 reasons why you should do something rotten. <laughs> Uh, he chases nymphs. He Then when he's rejected, he takes revenge. So he's sexually immature. He's emotionally immature. Um, but he, he, can, he can separate that, right? He can go cheat on his wife and get to the office a couple hours later and make all sorts of uh, decisions um, as if he's a detached, objective, rational, uh, you know, um, unbiased judgment. Um, and let's see, so, so this is scientific reasoning. I mean, Apollo has all that, has the science where you have facts and you draw inference, mathematics, uh, speech making, argument, forming arguments, delivering speeches, a lot of your schoolwork is Apollonian, um, right? Those are the skills, analysis. Um, and you're the detached observer, right? You're doing this research about women this or about science that, um, or you're taking math and seeing patterns. And you have exams where, you know, everybody takes the same exam because you know it or you don't, and it, there's nothing personal in it, right? So that's that's the Apollonian goal. Well, what about Odysseus? He's always calculating, right? He is calculating. So he calculated what reward to give to the soldiers. And um, he also accused Hecuba of being so emotional, right? You're just, crazy emotionally. You're irrational. I'm not. <laughs> but in his calculation, what's the reward to the soldiers? Oh, you get to have hot sex with a woman, you know? So obviously he does like, you know, he gives the reward that he would want. And he even said that. I want to leave behind a legend. You know, I want done to me what I've done to Achilles. So he really is projecting his own immature sexuality in his calculation of what the best reward would be. Um, let's see. And he accuses everybody's, you know, emotional but him. Um, it's annoying. <laughs> let's see. Oh, and then at the end where he says, you know, you Trojans, you're such barbarians, you violate hospitality agreements. So the Apollo guys tend to have a moral superiority complex. If you remember when we we're reading about the gods, the Hades types, the Poseidon types, they always have inferiority complexes relative to the Zeus and Apollo types. Um, and it's not fair, right? 
but they they do they have that complex and Odysseus definitely had that um all right so then we had Hermes Hermes is the mediator and he also can be a trickster right so he can mediate between the men and the gods and he can send the messages from the gods but he can be a trickster so that means you always it's just like at Delphi what you think the gods are telling you is a riddle and you're responsible for how you interpret it because Hermes might have been tricking you. Okay, now in the case here, it's Polymester, right? Polymester is the one who's mediating. So in his own mind, he was the, he was the weak, weaker city-state, right? But now he thinks he has both city-states completely wrapped around his finger because Agamemnon depends on him completely. And he knows that. He just doesn't know that Agamemnon is going to forget about it. So he knows that they're his friends and that they depend on him. And Hecuba and Troy has totally been totally destroyed. So all of a sudden, in his mind, he's the most powerful guy there, right? He is the most powerful person in the room. But he abuses his power, right, for greed. And um, he really pays a huge price. It didn't occur to him that Agamemnon would violate hospitality and let Hecuba have a private conference with him in order to take revenge. This is so outrageous. But people in the developing countries, and this is, I warn you, the superpowers will get together, even if they're technically enemies in other respects, and they'll just treat the developing countries like chess, you know, players on a chessboard. I was reading Bangladesh history, and I just, oh my God, because of its location, you know, when they're going through the independence movement, it was China, Russia, the US, India, were all treating Bangladesh just like a pawn on their chess game, you know? And, and even though some of these countries had problems, I think India and the US had other issues. Oh, Pakistan too, right? We had other issues with these countries, but when it came to Bangladesh, it's just like, hmm, what do you want to do with them? Hmm, what do you want to do with them? <laughs> oh my gosh. So um, I feel, I see my country's history is not like that. And then you wonder why they have more difficulty having a democracy perhaps, although they're, I mean, they're doing really well considering, oh my gosh, but they're, they're just doing well in a lot of ways. Although if you are Bangladeshi, I'm sure you know better than I do, but my first impression is that they've done quite a bit, and that's what Nicholas Kristof thought. But um, anyway, so polymester, any third world city state, you know, any minor player ought to be pretty careful because those superpowers or X superpowers, they get full of themselves and the leaders can go into cahoots and um, flatter each other and sort of make deals with each other and, and affirm their superpower status. So this is going to happen definitely between China and the US and Russia is gonna be in there and everybody, oh, I hate to think about it, <laughs> but it's gonna be there. Um, Demeter, all right, so we know about Demeter. Um, her daughter gets abducted and she destroys everything. Well, you know, this sounds like Hecuba, right? Um, so the Greeks are aware of the delicacy involved, remember with Delphi, of unifying the basic drive to preserve children, maternal instinct, with the rule of citizens under law, because that's the Delphi thing, is that you change from just having this natural cycle the snake to then having reason protect 
the goddess. And um, but you have to be really careful, right? Don't harm the goddess or fertility, all those things. Um, let's see, you can't destroy this drive, this maternal instinct that women have to protect their kids because every kid needs at least one adult who's completely obsessed about them or they won't survive. Um, also, if children aren't cuddled when they're little, they grow up really weird, like permanently weirded out. Uh, it's so it's, it's serious stuff. Uh, okay, then we had Gaia. Uh, if you remember, Uranus abused his power and she fought back. So it's the passive aggressive thing. Uh, she cut off his genitals. And then Kronos abused his power. He eats his children. Um, and, and she fights back by hiding Zeus in a blanket. And he goes over to Crete to get raised. So she also passively aggressively gets around him. Um, Zeus is also competes. He's not as bad, right? He's not as physically abusive. But uh, he's still, right, he's psychologically abusive. Um, he, you know, violates women. Uh, but he, remember, he let Persephone, he, Hades said, uh, can I abduct Persephone and make her queen of the underworld? <laughs> said, sure. Oh, gosh. Anyway, so... Um, so sex and war, infidelity often leads to war. That's how the Trojan War got started. Paris stole Helen. Um, young men are killed in war. Um, so the mothers, mothers are deeply wounded. So they're wounded in their roles as wives. Um, okay, so, so what I'm getting at is Hecuba, right? Hecuba as the story unfolds, she actually is activating the, the sacred passions of all, every single one of those goddesses. And I think that's really interesting. And I think the people who saw the play would know that right away. Um, okay, so Hecuba didn't go crazy. Many of her children were killed, but it was when the last heir, the last son, was killed, that she went nuts. So this is because women were judged by their ability to have a son. So she's playing the role of Hera, right? As long as she has a living son, she's done her duty and she's, you know, her city has a future. The thing is when she went nuts after he was killed, she, she crippled her city's future even though they didn't have an heir, she still crippled her city's future because people wouldn't let Troy rebuild, you know, even with a different person. So she just felt like it was all over when it wasn't her family that was going to, you know, lead the next generation. Um, Societies believe it's necessary to condition women to want to have children and sons. They were conditioned to focus on care. Uh, Hecuba, and then you remember, she was um, always debating. There was this big debate. Why does she have Polyxena, this really wonderful daughter, and she has Paris, this really awful son? And um, she's talking about with Polyxena, she said, ah, oh, you know, when nobility is never, um, is no matter what, nobility shines out. She made it sound like it was innate and it wasn't, it was Polyxena's choice. So she misinterpreted what that meant instead of, wow, Polyxena has a really strong character and it came out in the critical moment and it was her free choice. And I'm amazed. I think my children, my son was talking to me. He's got troubles at his school and stuff. But 
honest to God, I'm like amazed at how mature he is. And I don't take credit for it, right? He, cho he chooses to be this. And um, I just have a lot of respect for him. But that's, that's how Hecuba should have treated Polyzena. And there is a, um, Cahill Gibran talks about your children. And he said, you can um, try to be like them but you can't make them try to be like you. And I actually, I do look at my son sometimes and I think I want to be more like him because he's so mature. <laughs> it's, I don't know if I'm not, but I mean, he really is a, a role model. Like I can keep in mind all the obstacles he has and he inspires me. So that kind of, Hecuba could have been that way toward her, um, daughter, and I'm sure all of you, um, someday your parents, I'm sure they admire and respect you, but someday they can to completely be inspired by you too, because of all the things you're doing and you're going to do. Um, but, right, civilization is at war with the natural and the maternal, right? This is where reason declared war on Gaia the earth. Um, all right. A society that oppresses women, kills innocent children, will be destroyed because women will fight back. And they should fight back. Like that society shouldn't stand. Um, so uh, Euripides was actually, a lot of his plays show that he was a great supporter of women. And he was very critical of the way men treated women. All right, so here's Hecuba going through all these powers. Okay, as Hera, she's dishonored as the wife of Zeus because, okay, because her son was killed, but also when she's talking to Odysseus, you can tell that she's the wife of the king because she knows about good leadership. Um, so she does play the role of Hecuba. She knows what's honorable. She knows that Odysseus is honored as a leader, so he could change his policy because he will still be honored. So she understands that. But then also the killing of her son, that was her other role as, a, as a, the wife of the king. And then with Demeter, of course, she was totally destroyed and she reacted the way Demeter acted. I'm gonna starve everybody out, right? Uh, Persephone, she, she had that experience of powerlessness, of, you know, like getting raped, of extremely, extreme violence, but it was through her children, extreme powerlessness. Um, so she, she felt that way and she took revenge, just like Gaia did, passive aggressively took revenge. Um, so, you know, when Agamemnon says, I can't take, I can't punish Polymester because we have hospitality with them. She said, that's okay. Just, <laughs> just give them an audience with me and I'll take care of it, right? So she's doing that indirect thing because she's not one of the guys, but she can get in there and do a lot of damage. <laughs> um, Okay, then with Aphrodite, she uses Cassandra um, to corrupt judgment, and she uses their weaknesses, right, sexual attraction. Um, and also with Athena, she is capable of deliberation, and she uses that same capacity to get injustice. So when she's talking to Agamemnon about um, you know, there is justice, there's a universal principles of justice, and you have to, you have to do everything you can to um, bring back justice. Well, that's true, except that he shouldn't, he couldn't do that, like he couldn't do what she wanted him to do and maintain justice, but she convinced him that that would do it. Um, but the idea is she is capable of deliberation about justice, then 
she is cap she knows when she's corrupted um, what is really the best thing to do. And then with Artemis, she became very aggressive and a man hater, right? Uh, okay, so I think I'm gonna stop there because that ties it back to what we've studied. And hopefully all of you will have something to say. Um, there is, there's so much in this play that you can um, think about. Homer's message, don't treat people unjustly, it will come back to get you. Um, I don't know, it could just go on and on. It's, I don't know, I, I love this stuff. But the other thing about it is when I hear the news, I can just picture somebody writing a tragedy with these different characters because there's so many of the same types of situations, types of people. Um, two days ago, I, I think this is relevant. So, because I do want you to get a sense that day-to-day -day stuff is connected to this. Um, so we started for the first time to have a army reserve, ROTC. It's a military program where students can get a free college education, but then they have to be in the military for at least four years. So four years of college, four years in the military. They have to once a month, I think for a weekend, they go with uh, reserves and train and they have to take certain classes and all this stuff. So the guy who's running that program, his office is two doors from my office door. And I never go into the office in, right now because I'm teaching one class and actually I'm gonna start going into the office, but for a long time I wasn't vaccinated and I just thought, why should I, why should anybody on campus be any more vulnerable, right? I don't really need to, but I was over there during the day for some reason, can't remember, but he saw me and he said, are you Dr. Beck? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, I have to tell you that you are like a legend around here. Like my students have so much respect for you. And I, I just thought I had no idea because I don't have any idea how people think of me because I, you know, I, tr I don't judge them, but three quarters of their parents think I'm corrupting their children and that I'm an atheist and I don't believe in the city's gods. I mean, I know that their backgrounds and the things that they get drilled into them are very much at odds with what I teach. And you can imagine that. I don't think that's hard for you to imagine. So, and also the students learn how to be passive aggressive. They learn how to be polite, right? Their parents tell them, you know, respect your teachers, respect elders, whether or not you agree with them. So there is a lot of passive aggressive behavior, like a lot of gossiping about professors. But I try to stay out of all of that stuff. But I did tell him, I told him, I really appreciate that because I have no idea what the students think of me. But he was explaining, you know, his philosophy, his background is in police and military. And um, that's really hard. Those are really hard jobs because they're violence, right? You're having to deal and you're having to deal with that split second. You're in a critical situation. And of course, in the US, we're having this huge thing about Black Lives Matter and all these Black people are getting murdered, right? Killed by police officers. And um, the conversation sort of went there at one point. And he said, every police force I've been on, every police officer I know is told that for every three car stops and arrests for white people, you have one black one, it's a quota. And so he, you know, I have to 
write a ticket for this white guy. It's going 10 miles over the limit and the black guy can drive 15 miles and I have to let him go. And so, so my inclination though, because he talks about his principles that, and he's committed, he wants to protect his country, he wants security. And he went on about certain principles and he's a, he's a, he's a good person. So I would have loved to get him down in a conversation, right? Okay, here's the conversation that policing is really hard, but there is a difference between use of force, right? The ultimate use of force. And so we would just distinguish between these things. And so that's what I, I just have this incredible desire to take a person like that who has good intentions and strength of character and all sorts of stuff and build a bridge, right? Between the conservatives and the liberals or whatever. But also I think people like that get taken advantage of because we went to Iraq so that uh, Mr. Um, Cheney could get rich. He got stinking rich off of Iraq. It was totally money motivated. But um, people who are the boots on the ground and really suffer don't necessarily know that. Um, so, but I mean, my inclination would be just to get into dialogues and to just listen. My inclination is to start out letting that person talk and everything they've ever thought, you know, all the stuff and the liberals are wrong for this reason and that reason. I like to know that stuff because I know that I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I think that that's, I hope that that's helpful because um, that's that dialogue, that desire to get in dialogue with people rather than to demonize, you know, knowing that you, ha you don't have the complete point of view and you really wanna get people sitting down and talking to each other that's the only way to have a democracy, but it's really only the only way to have any kind of meaningful community. Um, and so, so that I can't quite, I guess in the end, there is a moral order there that we're all accountable to. And we can find it if we just try. It's not rocket science. It just takes some time. And what I think the problem is, I was just thinking about this recently. Remember when we talked about being in love with love and you're in love with your love of your kid and you're in love with your love of nature and it causes you. I think that philosophers can fall in love with their love of wisdom and they demonize everybody else because they aren't actually concerned with actually helping become wiser and, you know, increasing the amount of wisdom. They're just in love with their love of wisdom. And actually trying to gain practical wisdom is a much more difficult process. But I, I actually get pleasure out of it. Uh, because I like having all of my unexamined assumptions exposed. That makes me happy. Because <laughs> now you know, I don't think I know what I don't know. Anyway, so I hope that's helpful. But um, so, okay, okay. Okay, so Rupia wrote, right. And she said women are, um, women are more capable of going out into the public sphere because they're really good and multitasking, true. Um, and they all are really used to being hardworking and responsible because, um, because taking care of a kid means that you don't think about yourself at all. You just think about the well being of the kid. And that's a really good habit at your job, right? You're not in it for your ego, you're in it to create a community at work and also to achieve the goal of the company. So just that habit of always putting 
the group first, putting the goal first is a really good habit rather than to make a company or an organization a function of your ego, right? Okay, so uh, Poppy, what have you got? Do you have a reaction now? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna wait too long because you can always type in if you um, hear me. All right, so Louis, I'm gonna wait and I'm gonna go through everyone the first time. And then I'm gonna, I'll go, I'll come back to you if we have time. Uh, Madeline, do you have something? Let's see. All right, I don't, oh, there we go. One thing that really stuck out to me about what you said was that having at least one parent being focused on the child is very crucial for a child's success. I'm a psychology major. We've learned the effects of parenting and how they are important. It made me realize how strong women are because raising children is a hard task and women seem to be the one to be that parent, yeah. But that's also why I think they're good in the workforce because they're just used to multitasking and they're used to having things happen that they hadn't planned ahead. There's lots of really good character strengths that you get out of it. Um, but, and that has big, been a big problem in development. You know, you give women rights, but then children get denied you know, their needs or their right to get, you know, adequate attention. So it's, that often happens. A less powerful group might get brought up a little bit, but then it's at the expense of the next, uh, you know, the, the class below them, instead of all boats rising, right? So that's just a big problem. Um, Rook nine, do you have something? Okay, I'll, you can type in the chat if you, or if you're hearing me or you have something. Claire, do you have something? Are you there, Claire? Okay, News Rock, do you have something? All right, Al, I'll put you on hold for a second. Okay. Oh, okay, Poppy, are you, do you have something you'd like to type in or say? Okay, just type it in. I'll read it. I'll read stuff as soon as you type it in. Uh, News Rock, do you have something? Um, Lakin, do you have something? Um, no, all right, not even after I said something. Okay, um, where am I? Nahida, um, okay, Untari, do you have something more? Oh, Nahida, are you there? Good. Yes. So here, uh, from your speech, uh, here, from the Greek and Greek God, God and goddesses. And we found uh, some are victims of circumstances and some are intentionally follow their lifestyle. If we part ourselves in their shows, so it will be more clear to us about our life, about human, human life and uh, their tragedy. So everything, so 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 that we can uh, we can uh, we can learn from them. We can learn from their experience as well, and we can um, we can apply uh, those uh, those things in our own life as well. Good, yeah. That's that's ancient humanism. We have a common humanity. Starts out with empathy, 
yeah, that you can identify with people. I mean, I can understand Hecuba, right? <laughs> I'd really like to take revenge too. Um, and I remember that when I when my kids were little, oh my gosh. Anybody look cross-eyed at my kids and I'm <laughs> but <laughs> um you wait if any of you have kids, you're gonna understand this. It I was sort of surprised about it. But um yeah, that, that's a basic foundation of ancient humanism. We're all capable of great good and great evil. So we have to educate ourselves. Um, and the poets are great educators. Um, Nusra, let's see, Untari. Anything else, Untari? Deep, oh. I think I agree with the message about don't let sacred emotions get too strong and become obsessive and destructive because not only someone else will suffer, but the person himself. But for Hecuba, I found it a little bit different because her reason is the motherly nature that leads her to act like that. Still, her act was wrong though. Even though emotions are hard to control, but from what I've remembered, almost all of the gods suffered because of their obsessive emotions. That's right, right? So when you have those kinds of emotions, you always have reasons, right? You have good reasons, but for doing the wrong thing. So just because you have good reasons, it doesn't mean that was the right choice. So yeah, that's when it gets obsessive. Um, DT, do you have something? Anything else? Fahima? Okay, so I, I'm going to call on people that have spoken already, unless somebody wants to type in. If anybody who hasn't spoken yet, uh, you can type in and I, I just have the list right there and I can call on you next. Uh, Louis, you got something else? Um, yes, I got two things. Uh, firstly, um, when you said that like we, we, we should try to be like the child rather than for them to be like us, I think women might be more better than men at this path. They try to like understand the child and give them chance to flourish and develop to their full potential. But is it ridiculous that uh, society give them a lot of compliment about this, but at the same time, the society stick the woman with this task and limit their right and abuse their freedom. So that's the first thing I got for uh, what you said. And the second thing, like uh, when you read the Homer message, like if we suffer unjustly, like don't get sacred emotion become destructive. I think this is one of the important thing that not only Greek culture want to teach people, but also like liberal art education when want to teach the children, uh, teach the student. Because like, I think no matter how good we are about academic knowledge, no matter how well we did in practical school, we still need to combine all of them to our moral and sacred passion. I think this is the only way to use our ac academic knowledge in a meaningful way. Uh, when we go out for university, I think life will be radically different. We will suffer unjustly in some way because it is how society operates, I think. And we, we even could love ourselves mid-treat order as the way we suffer without knowing it. So I think, yeah, we need to be aware of, of the hormone masses. Like if we suffer, we, we have, like we don't let sacred emotion, sacred passion, like be um, destructive. Is that what I think? Okay, good. And also, yeah, society cripples women's freedom by 
making them, forcing them to be obsessed with their kids. And then they go and wound their kids, right? And then, you know, and then they react then, and then they get blamed for that. So it is, it's, ter you know, it's rotten. <laughs> but as long as a woman, if you can just step back and realize this is awful, right? I'm getting put in this spot. Anyway, it could go on and on, but okay, Al, have you got something? I think, uh, well, something you said made me think of it, but it's important to remember that Hecuba isn't bad for having this intense feeling, uh, this want, this desire to like uh, take revenge. The fact that she wanted to, you know, hurt someone else as much as she's been hurt, that's not what we should, um, we should frown on. What we should frown on is her not having the the for the the forethought to take a step back and say, well, I feel this way and it's okay to feel this way, but even though I feel this way, that doesn't mean I should go and do it, you know. And it's uh, it's a reminder to audiences that you're going to have very strong feelings sometimes, and that's human. Uh, that that it happens. What's important isn't making sure you don't feel like this. What's important is that when you feel like this, you deal with it in a healthy and proper manner. Right. Thanks. That's what therapists, you know, therapists tell you, you have to be able to express your thoughts. You have to know how you're feeling, right? You have to be able to, to feel. It just, you don't always act on how you feel, but repressing your feelings is really unhealthy, right? So that's what the plays try to say, right? It's okay identify with this feeling just don't act on it does that make sense Al? yes yeah that's a therapy <laughs> they do that okay may have you got something yeah um i also have to comment about what you said like the first thing is when the part about he cuba when nas when um the last son i like, was killed but but uh, when the other children were killed, she was not angry. And you said that um, it's also about one stereotype about woman. Like she finishes her duty when she has uh, still has kids. I think that that kind of uh, that kind of thought still exists in today's world, not just in Greek mythology or like a long time ago. And even in the context of my country, Vietnam, I even see that. Um, the, like women and even like people in general um, even think that the woman only like uh, finishes her duty when he when she has like the children who are son like when she when she has the daughter or something it's like nonsense it's meaningless for like the society and like even my mother and even many women around me still has kind of thought like in mind and I think it's it's a very sad stuff and there might be um a long still like a long time in the future um that people can change it um and one more thing I want to say is that um I see there are a lot of patterns in um the goddesses and I think it's even like in humans like uh, behavior and thought for example, like Demeter and her Cuba, they, they all like become like irresponsible, irresponsible for other people's life when their children like like go away from them, kind of like that. And but I also think that it's a really tough thing for them as well because they they have to like suffer from the loss but also they need to have um, the responsibility for other people as well. It's really a tough task to really like um, manage and balance between those kind of stuff. But also I think that um, to Greek, go Greek goddesses and also Greek mythology in general, I can see like the patterns um, in behavior and, ch and changes in a lot of like um, goddesses and people. Yeah, kind of like that. Very good. We have one more. Rossi, go ahead. Hi, Professor. Um, 
I did have, I did want to comment on Homer's message where he said, don't treat people unjustly, it will come back to haunt you. It reminds me of a Buddhist teaching where it's related to karma and that's always something that my parents tries to teach me daily is that I should um, treat other people the way I wanted myself to be treated because things goes around even if we don't like you know, no matter whether we like it or not if we treat someone badly it will just cycle back to you and i've witnessed it in real life like um when kids who are like kids who treat their parents badly and who harms their parents when they have their own children like their own children will like beat them up and like they'll like do bad things to them and then my mom especially she's like religious and so she always points out those examples for me to see and so she's like better treat me well if you don't want your own kids to treat you but but I feel like even if we believe the Buddhist teaching or not it's something that is important for us to have in our own lives just treat people with respect yeah. right um but it's okay to feel these things just don't act on them and realize you know it's better to come to some common agreement um and uh yeah well remember when uranus uh mistreated Kronos and Kronos cut off his genitals and then Kronos is all paranoid about his kids <laughs> right so I yeah that's exactly what happens I've had students talk to me about that so next time is a slideshow about Athens and there are some outlines um, so again it's not a long assignment um, but I do you do need to take notes for your final paper about what you got out of the Hecuba. Um, you don't have to post it. Um, and then read the outline for next time. And I really hope that I hear from hear from you because I haven't been assigning a lot because I'm assuming you're working on your research papers or making up your other schoolwork. So that's the plan. And I, I hope it works out. I hope you don't think my class is a whole lot more work than other classes. I really have lost track. Um, but anyway, okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor. Take Thank care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, so Bye -bye. you. Thank you Professor. See you on Wednesday. Yep. Thank you, Professor. Of course, Untari. You have a funny picture. There they are. Everybody there? Is everybody, anybody want to talk to me? I'll shut you down if your internet has gotten messed up. Okay, take care guys.